uh, first up, I want to talk, well, even though it's becoming less uh, fashionable to talk about, I want to talk about COVID. COVID, the disease that has for two and a half, three years, completely dominated life, not just here, but around the world. And I think many of us looking forward to a summer and going to the beach and going to the concerts and not worrying so much about uh, the COVID. I must say, what was it, four or five weeks ago, I finally got it and I survived and I went home and I isolated. But it, uh, I did note, I didn't tell anyone official that I had COVID. I didn't notify it. And I don't know if I, I broke the law, but... That, I guess, was my uh, human personal reaction to a disease that now seems to be becoming part of, of, of the furniture, like the flu. And, of course, many saying that it was all a great conspiracy by the WEF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what is happening with COVID as it drops off the radar and the one o'clock briefings uh, disappear? Well, throughout this thing, despite there'll be howls of outrage uh, and lots of texts from some of you, one person I've always enjoyed talking to uh, since the platform started about the COVID is uh, Michael Baker, uh, Professor Michael Baker, one of the government's, uh, well, I think advisors on this, one of the experts that we've heard so much from lately, and well, I thought we'd get him on this morning for a bit of an overview of where we're at and what's called the third wave of Omicron. So uh, Professor Michael Baker joins us now. Nice to have you back, Michael. How are you? Well, Rena, Sean, good to be back. All right, have you had the COVID yet? No, I, I, I've managed to avoid it, but, uh, you know, like most people, I'm expecting to encounter it at some point. All right, you're worried about that? Uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, uh, although, like, um, I'm hopefully you, all of your listeners, I'm fully vaccinated and boosted. I mean, that's the, the, the most important you thing. You know that's going to that's set them off, Michael. Uh, I don't know, actually. I mean, the, the, the scientific evidence is so overwhelming. I don't know why anyone wouldn't take advantage of that free uh, service. Mm. But that's, that's, the, that's the main reason why I think um, if I do get the infection, it will be uh, much more survivable. But um, we do have a lot of tools now to manage it, and we can perhaps talk about those. But, yeah, okay. Uh, but where are we at, okay, where are we at with cases? And as I said, I suddenly realised I didn't notify mine. Was, did I break the law or do something wrong? I went home till I, I, did, I tested negative. Um, but I didn't ring the health department and say, I've got COVID. Yeah, well, uh, as you know, it's um, uh, an expectation that people will report um, a positive result um, mm. online. And uh, that... I didn't um, know that, uh, actually. That's just why I didn't do it. Yeah, but the, the, the thing that is a, a requirement is that you self-isolate for seven days. Yeah. So that, that and I think that's very fortunate. Um, personally, I don't think that most employers would want you turning up at work with this infection and infecting your workmates and yeah. customers if you are in a, um, a workplace rather than working from home. So I, I think it's very good we've retained that yeah. restriction, for instance. So when we say we're in third wave, and what was it? Uh, we topped 4,000 for the first time in three months last week. Um, is that the true figure, or given that there'll be a lot of people like me who don't report, is it likely to be higher than that? Yeah, I think it could easily be double that number. But one thing is that we've got lots of different data sources, and the, the thing to look at with this is the, the moving average. Uh, so that's the weekly average of cases per day, because you know, of course, it goes up and down each day, depending yeah. on a day of the week and there's a very distinct weekly pattern we've had from really early on. But the moving average is around three and a half thousand cases a day now. It could easily be seven thousand cases. Yeah. Uh, the number to look at also is hospitalizations and that's hovering around the four hundred mark. And that's because basically people don't want to go into hospital with this infection. So you have to be fairly sick. And about one percent of cases are going to hospital. And then, unfortunately, deaths, um, you know, we've got 20 to 30 a week. And that's now, that's and with half. or of? Uh, that's of. Now, there's, there's another... Um, of of a directly attributable to Omicron. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, basically, quite, you know, for at least six months, there's been a very vigorous investigation of uh, everyone who dies from the infection. And... Uh, to be to, to be looked at if you've if you had infection 
um, in the previous 28 days, you had a positive test result and you died in that period, you're looked at. Now, about 20% of the cases are found not to be caused by COVID, so they're taken out. And then about of the rest, um, about a third uh, had other underlying illness and COVID contributed to their deaths. And then about half of them, or it's about two thirds, sorry, of the rest, uh, are directly caused by COVID infection. Okay. Um, what's the average age of those people? Good question. I, it will be uh, probably in the um, 60 plus, but I actually don't know what the average is at the moment. Okay, but primarily older people. That's right. Okay. Um, people our age or older, uh, Michael. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is the health system with levels of, what, 400 people hospitalised, are we anywhere near that breaking point that was the justification for all the measures we took early on? Is the health system, because of Omicron and because of the third wave, under intense stress and about to break? No, not, not at all. And uh, w the problem is that um, it's 400 people in hospital all the time. It's 400 beds that aren't yeah. available for other illnesses. So uh, no one wants to have another illness that's putting that number of people in hospital all mm. the time. But the ICUs aren't overrun or anything, are they? Anywhere near? No, and one of the reasons is that because New Zealand, with its very vigorous response, it delayed the arrival of this virus for two years. So it didn't take off until February uh, this year, two years after many mm. other countries. And by the time it arrived... Firstly, we were highly vaccinated, so that greatly reduced its impact on the health system. And the other thing that was quite a revolution was that people discovered you didn't need to put people on ventilators very often. And most cases are treated in a ward with oxygen. Uh, they're given steroids. They're given other drugs, which means that it, the, the risk of dying in a hospital has been greatly reduced. Mm. And not, not that many people are in intensive care at any point. So that was the big fear, and it was based on what the disease did during its first few months overseas. Okay, but it's changed. Now, it's changed. Yeah, the management. All right, uh, I'm going to be honest. Let's compare that with the flu, Michael. Yeah. How many people are catching the flu? Can we estimate every day in New Zealand? Uh, not many at the moment, but in the peak of the season, I mean, the flu infects about a third of the population every year, oh, every okay. winter when it comes through. All right. And how many people uh, does that kill a year? Around 500. So if it was 10 a week, it'd be 500. So this might have double the fatality rate of, um, well, uh, of the flu. Uh, well, if we look this year... Um, uh, COVID-19 is going to probably cause around 2,500 deaths in New Zealand. Yeah. And so it's about five times the flu. Okay. Uh, and and the flu usually puts about 2,500 people in hospital every winter. Right. But COVID-19 has put about 21,000 people in hospital this year. All right, year. though it's not a competition, obviously. Um, all right, the question I'm going to ask you broadly and overall then, uh, M Michael... Even this is the third wave of Omicron, it would appear to be a wave that, while, while large, um, is, is not a tsunami and, and that COVID, as it stands at the moment, is not threatening our health system, is pretty well recognised by people and it's kind of under control as much as any disease can be. Yeah, look, I, I agree. It's not... Um um, overwhelming the health system at all. It's just, it's become another disease that's gnawing away at us and it's going to be one of our leading causes of death this year. Mm. And it's also, and I think its biggest health impact may be long COVID and I think the numbers are still coming in on that. I mean, the best estimates now are that around 6% of adults will still have significant symptoms after three months. Mm. And in many cases, that's enough symptoms to stop them going to work. Okay. And what are those of... significant s symptoms, uh, Michael, as they're emerging, as yeah. we know more about it? Well, they're in three groups. One is respiratory problems, chronic lung disease. Um, a second group uh, is chronic fatigue, and mm. with body pain and mood swings, cognitive effects, that's brain fog and other... Um, symptoms 
And this is just a very, probably the most comprehensive systematic review has just come out and it looked at those three groupings and it was it, it found uh, slightly over 6% of adults still had uh, symptoms in those categories. 6% of people who've had Omicron? Yes, right. Uh, oh. And it will be, have, it probably will include some of the earlier variant as well. And so it, will, it may take time before we know whether, I mean, Omicron may have slightly lower impact. Yep. Okay. But once again, Michael, I come back, I mean, chronic fatigue was with us before uh, uh, COVID. It just seems to me that if you like, and as you say, our understanding of the virus and the virus itself has changed uh, uh, over time. Is it a case, I guess, psychologically, that we just learn to live with this as another disease? Well, that, that's where we've, that's the point we've reached, that yeah. we are doing our best to live with it. Uh, but, you know, as we know, with all of these diseases that exact, I mean, this is going to be amongst our leading cause of death yeah. this year. And so we obviously don't accept it. Uh, accept it. We, we try and battle against it and lower the impact. Yeah. But we accept cancer. You know, cancer happens, don't we? We're looking for a cure, but cancer still happens and kills New Zealanders every year. Uh, the flu kills people. There is stuff in this world that we have to live with. Or indeed die right. of. Yeah. 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 And of course, we if we have tools available, we try and use them in the most effective way we can yeah. to minimise that harm. Yeah. Can you see... Is there the possibility of going back to the sort of restrictions that we had? And to be frank, Michael, that I think people are over and might not comply with. Can you see any point in returning to, to lockdowns, to mask wearing, to social distancing? Oh, no. Lockdowns are, are definitely not needed at the moment. Uh, I can't see a scenario with this virus where they will happen again. Uh, but... It's, other, it's using the other approaches in sensible way. So, for instance, we're coming into the festive season, and, of course, people you know, obviously want to get out and have parties and yeah. get together. We all want to do that. So it's now a matter of trying to say how can we minimise the number of people um, who um, you know, wake up a few days later with this infection and after you know, the office party. I mean, no one wants that, particularly when you're coming into Christmas. So it's just a matter of trying to do these things. Yeah, but it's away. not the end of the world if you do, Michael. And, and I think Des Gorman, who we spoke to about this, said somehow in a response we forgot humanity. We got the Im forgot the impact of the thing we were asking people to do that made marginal or might statistically have made a difference but also damaged, if you like, the fabric of humanity and the fabric of our society. Well, I, I think you need to separate out um, what we did in that first um, year, and I guess it moved into the second year as well, from what we're doing now. And so what New Zealand achieved, and it's like other countries in the Asia Pacific region, is we delayed what turned out to be the inevitable by two years, and that gave us a huge benefit. Mm. Uh, we've got a mortality, cumulative mortality, about a tenth of the high-income countries that had this virus circulating early on. Mm. Amazingly, New Zealand is one of the only countries that's still in what we call negative excess mortality. So our cumulative mortality over almost three years is less than if we'd ever had the pandemic because we've prevented these other infections. It's a remarkable achievement. Mm. And also, our economy performed relatively well by world standards over mm. that period. Yeah. I mean, well, Michael, I'll talk, to an econ I'll talk to an economist if I need economic advice. Um, okay. um, uh, Michael, you just said that our overall mortality has dropped during COVID, and I know I'm going to get a ton of texts of that. They're going to say, oh, no, sudden adult death syndrome is through the roof and unexplained mortalities, and I'm going to get morticians without medical training telling me there are blood clots and stuff. You're telling us the statistics show that there has not been an increase in unexplainable or, or the death rate in New Zealand since COVID? Uh, I'm saying the cumulative mortality up to now um, is still in negative territory compared with if we'd never had COVID. And that's, this is, you can look at several different, um, the Stats New Zealand site, the um, Our World and Data site, you know, there's a number of places where you can look at these data. But this year, 
we are seeing excess mortality, so it's catching up from the previous two years. So that's what's happening. And we've had a period, um, as Omicron has circulated widely this year, we've obviously seen uh, mortality rise. Uh, I mm. mean, that, that, that's the, well, I think 2,100 deaths or so attributed to COVID. And there's some mortality, mortality on top of that. And what we think, and there's quite a bit of evidence that um, uh, for some people who aren't diagnosed with COVID, they get the infection, it's not diagnosed, and your risk of um, uh, circulatory disease and sudden death increases. And this is heart attacks, strokes, um, mm. and pulmonary emboli. And this is exactly what we see with influenza, that most of the deaths from influenza are these circulatory effects that occur in the days and weeks after you have the acute infection. Yeah. Um, Michael, and all, well, a number of people, I'm not going to try and quantify it because I don't have data to support it, but I know a number of people who send me endless emails and texts um, say that uh, long COVID is only amongst those who have been vaccinated and that it is uh, the vaccine that is causing any health problems that are, that, that are appearing. Could you speak to that, please? Well, basically, people I trust who are doing the um, adverse event surveillance say that's rubbish. Uh, that there is, you know, uh, we do know that um, there's risk of um, uh, some problems, um, uh, myocarditis after um, vaccination, and it's killed possibly two people in New Zealand. It may, I don't know if it's more than that now. But th th these, are, these are known side effects. They're fortunately very rare. But the, the high-quality studies, and some of these have got millions of people in them, looking at um, what happens after this infection. Uh, it shows that vaccination reduces your risk of death and also long COVID very significantly. The other revolution, I think, now are antivirals, which are also very effective, Paxlovid, um, taken after in the first five days after infection, is also very effective at decreasing your risk of serious illness. And there's just data just coming out now showing it also decreases your risk of long COVID. So I think, you know, they're wonderful products that are saving many lives. Mm. Some countries, some states in the US, though, are starting to say young men shouldn't take um, the vaccine, uh, some companies, uh, some countries saying children shouldn't take the vaccine. Have you researched that? And why is there this official um, resistance, if you like, or concern about the vaccine itself? Well, I think over time, I mean, it, you know, with all um, uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals, and particularly vaccines, because they are given to healthy people. Uh, so it's very important that you're balancing benefits and risks. And it may be that if over time the risk of COVID infection, a serious outcomes is declining, uh, then the balance may shift away from giving the vaccine, particularly to young males who are, do have higher risk of myocarditis. So uh, it's possible. I, I mean, that, it'll be a finely balanced decision. At the moment, uh, it's very much advised that you get the vaccine right down to the age of five. Um, as you know, in countries that are rolling it out for children under five, uh, it's the recommendation is only for children who have serious immunocompromising illness. Uh, so it's not for all children. So I think that's in the younger age groups, definitely there's that balance of benefits and risks. All right. Um, Michael, I'm getting tons of texts here and, and I'll, I'll just be brutal, some of them not nice. Some of them claiming that they know these number of people killed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You must bear this, the brunt of this every day. What have you made of the small but vocal number of people who are described, I guess, collectively as anti-vaxxers? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I think it's largely people are influenced by disinformation, and uh, there are many uh, sources of disinformation internationally that have been extremely effective at disseminating this information. And uh, it just does not stack up with um, uh, scientific evidence. And there's, um, you know, if you look in very high quality journals, not just one journal, the whole lot, yeah. the science consensus is overwhelming that vaccines are, are life-saving with this, this infection, as they are for many illnesses. Yeah. 
And um, but there are anyway, many people who believe it was part of some conspiracy, or the vaccines have killed and injured way more people in New Zealand than than we know of. That it's a terrible, terrible thing. And I've got to say, I look for more than anecdotal evidence, and I often don't find it, or I get told to go and look at a video or do my research. I presume you do do your research in a quite sci- quite scientific way. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, there's over half a million papers on COVID-19 uh, and counting. Uh, so, uh, I mean, like most people, I'm, I look at summary papers and systematic reviews that look at lots of evidence. And uh, that's, and, and even then, I'm only barely keeping up. But there are lots of sites now that um, summarize the literature. And uh, I look at distillates of papers coming out. So that's the way of keeping up. Mm. Uh, and But in the end, you... That's why you have uh, in New Zealand dozens of scientists looking at different aspects of, of the pandemic and the response and a, a number of advisory committees, you know, on the vaccination and therapeutics, testing, um, the strategic direction. So that's the way of trying to assess um, current scientific opinion and the best um, course of action. And, of course, it keeps moving. And one thing about science is that everything we believe now will um, it's potentially wrong and we're just going to keep refining it. It's always a work in progress. There isn't a point where you say suddenly we know everything about something. Mm. What would you say then to groups like New Zealand doctors speaking out for science? Uh, Guy Hatchett, who's a doctor or something of transcendental meditation, who have vocal followings. And um, I've got to say, I've looked at some New Zealand doctors speaking out for science stuff, and I think they make some valid points about how once a political decision was made on lockdowns and vaccination, the very changing science that you've just spoken of was sometimes ignored by the government, which it appeared to me didn't want to back down or modify its advice, in particular, say, in relation to young men uh, being at risk of myocarditis. Uh, look, I think the um, people I really trust, and these are world experts on vaccinology, are endlessly poring over the data on adverse events. And uh, some of the actually world leaders in adverse event surveillance are based in New Zealand, and they are looking at this evidence. And basically, if, if there are serious adverse events, they want to know about them. And it's always of adding up the evidence for and against vaccination. So I think they're extremely, by nature, very critical. And they're very critical of, of vaccine technology as well. So I, I do know some of the people you mentioned who put out information, which I just find is, um, some of it's quite laughable. Their, their lack of ability to look at the sweep of evidence. So they cherry pick. And that's what scientists do not do. They try to systematically look at all the evidence on Can both sides. Can you give sides. us an example of the cherry picking? Well, I think it's um, really saying that, um, you, you know, this year we've seen a rise in deaths related to COVID-19. And they say, oh, that's all because of the vaccine. But m- most of the vaccine, much of it was given last year when we didn't have excess deaths. So if vaccine was causing the wave of excess deaths, um, surely we would have caused by vaccine. Surely we would have seen it last year mm. when we were giving lots of vaccine. We're seeing it this year, and it's because Omicron has circulated and may have infected up to eighty percent of New Zealanders. That's what that's what's killing people. It's not the it's not the vaccine this year. And so I just think that is very selective use of evidence to support a preformed view, and it just doesn't even make logical sense. Confirmation bias. Well, yeah, we all do that. Um, that's human nature. But um, scientists try and step away from that, and they actually use tools called systematic reviews, which um, uh, you know have a very uh, standardised approach for dredging for all the evidence and assessing it systematically, and they're putting it in peer-reviewed publications. If the people you describe were serious about this, they would be writing papers for journals and putting them forward for peer review. I mean, I've published more than 40 peer-reviewed papers since COVID started on this wow. disease. Um, because I want my opinions to be um, put out there, my assessment, mm. for review. And they've been in, you know, some of the world... Yeah, but Michael, journals. you've done nothing on YouTube. Ah, yes. 
And my daughter tells me my TikTok um, profile is dreadful. So, um, yes, I should be getting out there more. Mm. Um, do you think... So you're telling us you don't think we'll have to go back for COVID to the... And some would say draconian, I use the word advisedly, measures that we had uh, early on. Uh, Michael, do you think this, uh, if you like, vac vaccine cynicism or resistance, uh, do you think the chance of using measures like that again is essentially gone, the public mood has changed or moved past it? And to be frank, that many people, and I guess deep down in my soul I'd say the same, part of me is saying, was this ever such a big deal? Did we really have to do it in the first place? Yeah, well, if you look at a global level, uh, according to, again, the excess death calculations, and this has been done by, you know, several global health organisations, suggests that the pandemic's probably killed about 25 million people globally, and it's been the leading cause of death for probably may, this year, maybe its third successive year. So, yes, it is um, a big event, and nothing has... Um, hit the global population like on the same scale since the Second World War. And from an infection point of view, nothing has been on the scale since the 1918 flu pandemic. Mm. So yes, it is a huge deal. And countries that have managed it better, like New Zealand, some people might be saying, well, that wasn't so bad after all. And there's a reason for that. And that was because New Zealand took a very proactive approach, like Australia and Singapore in particular, and deferred the pandemic until we had vaccines, until we knew how to manage seriously ill people. And we've seen much better outcomes. On paper, New Zealand's had the best um, mortality outcome, I think, in the world now. Uh, in some of the areas, we haven't done so well protecting Maori and Pacific people, and I think that's been um, sad and, uh, and avoidable, but that's happened. Mm. Um, okay, Michael, look, thank you for the update. Um, and I don't feel too scared or afraid. Maybe it's the new normal, but at least it is a bit more like normal um, than it used to be. Um, I've had two shots. Should I have had more? And seeing well, I've already caught, yeah. caught COVID, why would I bother? Yeah, well, you don't need to bother for um, three months after you've had it. Uh, the advice is that um, certainly anyone uh, over 65 or 60 should have um, their third and fourth doses as well at some point. Mm. Uh, we'll probably find that in the future we, we may get offered a um, booster when we get our flu shot uh, every year before winter. We may move into that situation. But I, I don't know about... Um, other people, but I, personally, I feel much more comfortable knowing I've had four doses, and that you, you do it. Otherwise, you risk um, waning immunity over time, mm. and that does decrease your resistance. So the evidence is very compelling to get boosters. Mm. The other thing is, obviously, if you if you get sick and um, you're in an older age group or you've um, got underlying illness, is try and get your antivirals within five days. Yeah, I missed, I missed the boat on that. I didn't, wasn't kind of aware of them till, uh, till it was too late, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and the other things are, you know, the other tools we've got in New Zealand, I think, are very good from an, an evidence-informed. I think it's good that we've retained the requirement that people don't, you know, self-isolate and don't go out and infect all their friends and workmates. I mean, no one wants to do that, yeah. I, I assume. I think that's very sensible. Um, and the other thing is, just paying a bit of attention to ventilation. If you're meeting people for the Christmas party, try and shift it to a well-ventilated place, maybe um, outdoors undercover. I think it's really good. And what some organisations do is they ask everyone to do a rat test before they come. Yeah, I mean, yeah see, you're losing me there, Michael. You're losing me there. That's <laughs> too much okay. trouble. I, um, yeah. uh, uh, final question, because this is once NZDSOS, and it's clear you guys don't get on. Do you think there is a need now or when the dust settles a bit more to review how we responded to this pandemic, to have a big, broad-ranging review of the response? And particularly, I'm going to say, Michael, in regards 
and I am going to call it the propagandising for the jab. And there's no way you can look at me turning up, where do I, to some shopping centre to get the jab. That wasn't informed consent. I had been, um, and I'm going to say it, I'd been pressured like many other citizens to believe this was the right thing to do. My GP wasn't involved. There was no direct consultation, no consideration of my particular medical condition. I presume someone who wasn't even um, medically qualified stuck the needle in my arm. Do we need to go back and look, amongst other things, at all of that and just see if we could have done better? Yeah. Look, it, it, this is such a massive disruption that we definitely need to review it thoroughly. I think the government's more or less announced is going to be a Royal Commission and I expect that we'd see the terms of reference come out in the next few months. I mean, this will take... Uh, probably one to two years to do. So if it starts next year, for instance, it will probably uh, extend, you know, maybe up to two years after that. So it's going to be a long-term job. I mean, they, they always take time, those reviews. So I think we'd all, we, we've been asking the government to do that as well. I mean, there's so many things that need to be looked at. Michael, thank you very much indeed for once again uh, answering every question I asked you a a and for fronting. Uh, nice to have you on the programme again. Um, and if I don't see you beforehand, merry festive season to you. Thanks, Sean. Same to you. OK. Uh, Professor Michael Baker there. Tons of texts. I'll go through with them. Many, many, many of them slightly angry. Someone fronts for an interview. I ask them questions. They ask the questions. And they seem to be honest. That's how it works, isn't it?